Okay, I'm Steve Hein, originally from America. Now I'm living in Montenegro for the time being, mm -hmm. where I have a little hostel. Hi, I'm Luca. I'm pretty much trying to manage the place, the Steve's hostel. And I don't know if I'm good at it. <laughs> I hope yes. So this is the main entrance, as you can see, the street. The name of the street is 19th December. Whatever happened there. This is the parking area. As you can see it, and pay no attention on the sign, we just put it there to scare some people. So just follow me. As you can see, this is the mm, five star hallway. A lot of big stars were passing this hallway during the 90s, like Ben Affleck and Pamela Anderson. And, yeah. Dobar dan. Kako ste? Evo, nije loše. Snimaju dokumentarac neki iz Istambula do Berlina i na putu do Crne Gore <laughs> zaustavljaju se ovdje. So, this is the place where you can sit and relax. It's a bit messy, but doesn't matter. This is the entrance door. It says to call this number. This is my number if it's locked. And on this part it says, please don't call if you have a key. <laughs> so... As you can see, this is like a kitchen and a reception in the same way, uh, the same time. So this is the private room, you can come in. Like the homey atmosphere, as you can probably feel it. Do you feel it? <laughs> so the, the other room is a dormitory. You can see a lot of stuff is saved from the <laughs> Time after the Second World War, probably it's like a Yugoslav furniture and original so signs and stuff. Big, big heaters. Yeah, you can see the heaters, <laughs> which are very old. Like doing, they're hitting bricks, and then the brick is uh, saving heat, and it's it, uh, it is expelling it around. And I'm really not sure about how it works. Yeah, you can see the upper bed and the long stairways to the <laughs> upper bed. Ah, double bed and a few more mattresses if it's needed, because it knows to be pretty crowded here during the summer days, the July and August. Yeah, this is the storage. We pretty much keep everything here that you need, because as you can see, this bed, this bed Steve made himself. And he also started a bone collection. <laughs> From, uh, um, from our guests, <laughs> who didn't survive. <laughs> hey, why am I in Montenegro? And it's funny because a lot of people in Montenegro want to go to America, but I like it here. And um, so I tell people I was just traveling around. I was on my way to Turkey, actually. I had an idea to go to Turkey for a while, and then from Turkey go to India, because I'd never been in India. So I was passing through Montenegro and I came to the capital because I had to get my computer worked on. I had to wait a few days for some parts or something. And um, I found out there was no hostel in the capital. And I've been to maybe 50 some countries and I've never been to a country that didn't have a hostel in the capital. And also to get back to your question about why a hostel, I've stayed in hostels for a long time. I've been traveling in hostels since I was about 21 or 22 and now I'm 53 I think. So on and off, I've been in hostels all around the world for a long time, and I like hostels. I was just telling Jan that if uh, everybody grew up in hostels, we wouldn't have wars. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that, actually. <laughs> on uh, couch surfing, they, they ask something like some special experience that you have, and on my couch surfing profile, I, I tell the story about a gypsy girl in Romania mm -hmm. who, uh, who I got to know, and she couldn't write or read. But uh, I taught her how to use my camera, and she really loved the camera. And um, I let her use it, and she never stole it. And a lot of people would say, oh, don't let her touch the camera. She'll run away, away with it and steal the camera. But she never did. And, and um, I saw her many days. And then on the last day of Romania, I needed to leave. And I saw her just before I left. And I tried to explain to her in my broken Romanian that I was going to be leaving. 
and I could see she was really sad. And so I gave her a little hug and I said goodbye to the mother. They were both there and they had just come back from picking up uh, leftover things from the vegetable market. Mm -hmm. And so she told me to wait, wait, just a minute. <laughs> and uh, she's, she reached down into her mother's bag and she pulls out a tomato. It was a half rotten tomato, but just the same, it was a tomato, and she wanted to give that to me as a gift. And I thought it's really interesting because they always told me the gypsy kids will steal from me, but here she is giving me something. So that was a really special time for me. So basically that's the altar of our alternative religion, the Rebetish, we call it. In fact, when it comes to religion, a lot of people ask me if I believe in God, and my answer is I believe in children. <laughs> So I really do believe in children. I've been to a lot of countries, as I said, and I've talked to children in all the countries, and I find they're pretty much exactly the same, and they mostly want to make friends, and mostly they want to do good things, what we call good things. So I, I guess I just, my philosophy is to be more like children and to believe in children, mm -hmm. and to help children, and uh, to care about them more and control them less. Mm -hmm. So they feel cared about, not controlled. That's some of my life, life philosophy, and also to listen to our feelings more. Mm -hmm. I was telling you earlier that I think we really need to listen to the feelings of children and shape the world to meet the emotional needs of the kids, and then we'd have a much better world. Instead of trying to change the kids to meet society, my, one of my parts of my philosophy is to change society to meet the needs of the kids. The first story I have about Montenegro actually starts before I came to Montenegro. A couch surfing couple from uh, from Ukraine, I think it was, no, Belarus, told me that uh, when they came to this country called Montenegro that I'd never heard of before, they said they met a guy who gave them a ride in some expensive car, and uh, he was bragging about how he has a lot of money now. And when he was young, he used to hitchhike, but now he has a lot of money, casinos and everything on the coast. And so he's driving them for a while, and then when he lets them out of the car, he says, here, here's a little spending money for you to encourage you to keep hitchhiking. And he gave them 100 euros. Oh. So that was the first I'd heard of Montenegro, so I thought, I want to come check out this country. Mm -hmm. But the people here, when I, when I came across the border from Croatia to Montenegro, I just immediately felt some difference here, that everybody's hugging each other and kissing, the guys are hugging and kissing. They're, they stop their cars on the street to honk and say hello to each other. Most of the time it seems like they're not honking because they're mad, but just to say hello to their friends. Mm -hmm. And those two cars will stop in the middle of the street, and block all the traffic and talk for a little while, and then they'll keep driving. And the way they park here, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's incredibly crazy. They park on the sidewalks. They drive on the sidewalks. Yesterday, somebody was driving on the sidewalk. We had to get out of the way for them. No one cares here. That's, they have such a relaxed life here. I, I really like it here. It's not perfect, but I haven't found a country that is yet. But I like it here. When I came here, people were parking all around my hostel, any place they wanted to. There was almost no paid parking. There were no parking spaces, no parking meters, just two years ago. And people were parking on the sidewalk, on the grass. They're parking this way, they're parking this way. You can just walk around for 20 minutes and you can't help but notice the way they park here. And to me, that's kind of fun and I like the spirit of the Montenegrin people. And I feel kind of sad when I see now some people are trying to force the Montenegrin people to park like everybody else, like park, park properly, some people say. And I'm really sad to see this because now some people have the, the power, the legal power to enforce the parking rules. So let's say your neighbor now has a job to enforce the parking rules. So he's going to give you a ticket for not parking the right way. So you, now you have a bad relationship with your neighbor. Before there was nothing to argue about. And I don't like to see how society gives some people power and then it goes to their head and they don't really have to explain anything, and they don't really have to feel any empathy for the person that they have the power over, they just have the power. So they can give a ticket and say, hey, it's just my job, and don't complain to me. And, but I really don't like to see this, how we divide people up and we give some people power. And I think it's really dividing the society when we do this, and it's creating a lot of resentment. So I would recommend just letting the Montenegrin people continue to park the way they park now. <laughs> Talking about how hostile life is different than my corporate life. <laughs> um, for one thing, you meet people from all around the world and you actually share the living space with them. I traveled in the corporate world for a while and I would stay in hotels. And basically every hotel is the same. You go inside your hotel room, turn on the TV set or do some work. Now everybody has their laptops in their hotel room probably. But um, you're alone. 
And in a hostel, you're almost never alone. In fact, if you feel lonely, just go to a hostel because you're in a dormitory room with people from different countries and um, you never know who's going to be in the country, but you can have five people from five different countries. And you, usually there's a kitchen where you can cook together. Sometimes you just go out together, but um, you have a chance to get people's views from all around the world. And I really think that this would help everybody if we could just talk to people from different countries to find out that we have a lot of things in common. I think we have more things in common than we have different. So I really like hostel living. Sometimes I personally need more privacy. In a hostel, you, it's, it's nice to not be alone, but sometimes you need privacy. So sometimes I have to get a room by myself if I want to do writing, for example, or something. But I think the hostels really break down these cultural uh, stereotypes because you see people face to face and you can talk to them. And, and the more you travel, I, th I really think the more you start to become similar. You share travel stories and you realize you don't really need this. Like when I started traveling, I, th I was carrying a lot more stuff. And the more I travel, the less stuff I carry. And people sometimes come here that haven't traveled much and they bring all kinds of stuff, hair dryers and perfume and three different kinds of cologne and four different pairs of shoes and lots of extra clothes they don't need. And you realize that those things don't matter. And I talked to a girl actually from Germany once who was a law student and um, she learned to travel very simply. And when she got home, she just kept wearing the same kind of simple clothes. And everybody in Germany looked at her like, what, are you crazy? Why don't you change clothes every day like we do and wear nice clothes and iron them? When it comes to ironing, I got rid of my iron many, many years ago, and I just realized, what's the point of ironing something? It doesn't make me a better person to have a flat shirt. And the same with ties. I also realized, what's the point of a tie? A tie doesn't make me a better person. It doesn't protect me from the rain. It doesn't keep me warm. So I just got rid of all my ties. <laughs> and you don't need these things. And you, traveling around the world simply with a backpack and staying in hostels helps you see what's really necessary and what's not necessary.